Hello, uh, I am Jake or Jacob, and either one is fine. Um, this will be a, hopefully a, a relatively concise talk. Um, in the process of preparing this, I kind of came to the realization that I may or may not actually be talking about micro front ends, uh, and you're welcome to argue with me about that later after Chad's done talking. So. <laughs> Um, so, I don't want to exit full screen. Why are you doing that? Um, <laughs> some history. Uh, so, around a long time ago, let's say around 2015, 2016, uh, I noticed that there was a lot of buzz going on around the internet about this concept of micro front ends. Um, basic premise. Uh, what if we took the model of microservices and applied it to our front end applications? So we have, you know, a bunch of different mini bits of functionality within our application and we, you know, build them all independently. Um, and then there's some kind of magical production process that then puts them on the page and they render on the page all by themselves. Um, what is that magical process, hand wave? A bunch of people had different implementations. It's kind of wild west at the time. Everybody was sort of taking their own little angle to it. Um, and a lot of, a lot of sort of custom tinkering and everything. Um, but it seemed to be the hot thing that people were talking about. Micro front ends. This is cool. Uh, React came up in that context because React was kind of cool at the time too. Um, but then, uh, uh, somebody new came along, Next.js started to build momentum, and everybody was really interested in full stack React MVCs now, and isomorphic things, and, and, uh, I don't really care too much about micro front ends anymore, cause wouldn't it be cool if everything ran on the same stack? And I feel like the buzz around micro front ends sort of died down a little bit. Um, and also, you know, at the time, uh, the work that I was doing, a React single page app was serving my purposes just fine. Um, and this seemed like a cool idea, but spending the time to tinker with it, uh, it wasn't in line with, you know, my production goals at the time. So it sort of fell off my radar um, until about a year ago. Um, I had a problem. <laughs> Um, I found myself working for a new company that had a legacy application uh, that was built on Microsoft.NET Framework, uh, plus some jQuery code, plus some Knockout JS code, uh, all sort of jumbled together. Um, and I found uh, that we were getting a bunch of bug reports for a particular area of the application. Um, and, you know, the product owners had asked, like, is there something we can do to help deal with these bug reports because our contractors aren't able to handle it correctly? You know, can you take a look at it? Well, I took a look at it. The first thing I noticed was, you know, part of the rendering is being done in Razor Pages. Part of the rendering is being done in jQuery code. Part of the rendering is being done in Knockout.js. And I also realized this wasn't reported as one of the bugs. But the thing took 50 seconds just to render an initial page load after it had received the data. And I was like, something's not right here. Um, and I'm kind of looking at it and I'm like, all right, I can't figure out why the developers that created this made some of the decisions that they did. Uh, knockout is deprecated. It's never going to get another update. We have these bad performance problems. It might be simpler to just go ahead and throw out the whole thing for that particular area of the page um, and just start from scratch. And so I started thinking about micro front ends again. Here's this idea that was really cool a little while ago. People stopped sort of talking about it. Uh, but maybe that can be a solution to my problem. You know, I really want to take a small piece of the application, embed it on a particular route within the larger application, and just start from scratch. I just want to build a React app. I don't want to deal with what's there already. 
So I start looking into it. There's a couple of frameworks around uh, that are based on creating micro applications nowadays. Uh, this is some of them. I just threw some logos up there. The point being, there's a whole bunch of people that have productized this concept now. Um, and I, so I'm thinking about it. And I'm like, well, okay, what are my goals for this? I want the, the ability to load specific React components into my view. I don't really need to load multiple separate apps within a single view. It's really a route that corresponds to a page has an app on it. Um, I want to minimize the amount of custom configuration that I'm doing. Um, I don't really want to throw a big disruption into the current like build and deployment process. Um, there's just not the budget for that. We need to fix the problem quickly. We need to get it out there. And I need it to be somewhat self-contained. And I want to defer that decision until later because uh, there's too much choice. I could be spend all my time studying what are the different micro framework applications. So this is where the question comes along. Is this really, a, do I really have a need for micro front ends or is this something else? Should I call this a mini front end? For a particular route, I want to render an application. I don't necessarily want three or four different applications on that route, it's just one. Maybe I don't actually need any new tools, and then this is the thing you can argue with me about later. Maybe this is just code splitting and it has nothing to do with micro front ends in the first place. <laughs> so what, what runs this stuff? Uh, you know, if you've done any recent uh, JavaScript development, ECMAScript development, you've seen this before, import something from some package. Have you seen this? This is the dynamic import uh, keyword. Uh, it reached full proposal stage in ECMAScript 2020, uh, so it's it's pretty much available on all your standard build tools and native in a bunch of browsers at this point. You know, it's it's part of the spec now. In 2016, it was not fully part of the spec yet. Now it is. From MDN, import syntax, commonly called a dynamic import, is a function-like expression that allows loading an ECMAScript module asynchronously and dynamically blah, blah, blah. It looks like a function. It's not a function. It's a keyword. Um, it behaves a little bit like a function, but also it's not a function. Not a function. Um, there's some helpers around this, and I'm about to jump into some code, so I'll demonstrate it, but React has the lazy helper. React Router has created their own lazy helper. I want to show uh, how to do this just with the React, um, and then I'm going to show how to, uh, to use React Router. So just to demonstrate, you don't necessarily, if you have a different routing paradigm that you like to use, you don't need React Router for this. Um, they just add a little bit of nicety around it. So we're going to try and do a demo now. Um, and I'm going to talk through a little bit of config here. Um, so if you're used to create React app, React scripts, you can do this with that as well. Um, that's deprecated, so I did this little demo in Veet. Um, Veet's pretty cool. You should use it if you haven't started yet. Uh, it, it is easy to use. Um, but uh, you may have noticed if you've been using React scripts uh, that they they normally generate a asset manifest JSON when you do a build. Um, this is useful information. Uh, Veet doesn't do that out of the box, but with a quick uh, config change, you can add manifest true, uh, and it'll do that same thing just like React scripts would do. Um, then, um, we're gonna pretend we're in, we're in, uh, .NET framework. We're not actually in .NET framework. We're in .NET core. I see Francis is here, and he would probably say, you should use Blazor instead. Well, in real life, I had .NET framework. I couldn't use Blazor, but we're just pretending now because I don't want to get that set up on this machine. Um, so, anyway, if you're going to go the Microsoft route, you might use Blazor, none of this matters. But if you're using, if you're working on a legacy project that doesn't have cool Blazor support, this is a viable option. So, using the, um, the, some tweaks to my vconfig, uh, 
I'm changing my output directory. Normally it'll be just within my project root and then the dist folder. Um, I'm going up a level and I'm dumping it up in my .NET project. Um, and I'm making sure that it generates the manifest. So what this does is when I build, um, it's going to dump the build from my, from my, uh, project up a level into the www root of my .NET project. Um, and I have this cool little secret file here that tells me where the stuff it built is. So, you know, every time you change code and rebuild, you're going to get a new hash on the end of your file names. Uh, this manifest file is going to tell you what that stuff is. So the one that I care about for all my tags is going to be index.html and then the file property. Um, then I just create uh, in my .NET uh, code, view code, um, I am going to create a little bit of a, uh, a partial, right? A partial view um, that handles just the rendering of my React code. Um, so there's two things that are happening in here. Um, I have some module code whoop, that is responsible for reading that JSON um, and generating a script tag for it, uh, or the URL for a script tag. Um, and then I have my partial render code up here. Um, there's two things I have going on here. I accept a dev mode argument to my model. Um, that's just a developer experience thing that if I want to set up my Vite server to run in dev mode, I can have the, the .NET app loading the scripts off dev mode. I have my live reload and all that. Um, there's a couple of extra script tags that Vite normally will generate on the index HTML that it's serving up. Um, and I just throw a copy of them on here as well. Um, otherwise, if I'm not in dev mode, I'm just taking the output from that manifest file and I'm using it to render a script tag. Um, and then before that, I'm also rendering the div that will become my React root. Um, then from there, um, within whatever page that I want to render a React view on, I just include this partial um, and nothing else. So I have two of those here. This is my student's page, very short. Um, all it does is set the title and render a partial, um, and that's going to render the entire React entry uh, on the page right there. So that's the .NET side. I'm not going to talk about .NET anymore besides knowing it's serving up the bulk of the application. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close that. We're going to get into React. Um, so the structure of my React app, um, if you think back to uh, the, the micro frameworks paradigm, there's still something that needs to tie everything together to get the content on the pages. Um, I figure, why not let's just use uh, a small React app itself to render all of our little sub apps or our, our micro front ends. Um, so we're going to enter in through uh, our index or sorry, our main. Um, the main is, let me just drop this down a little bit. It does a, only one thing. It renders the router. Um, so I'm using a React router. It renders the router and no extra container information or anything like that. Um, so I have two routes in my router just for the sake of demonstration. I have a student's page um, and I have an other page which is not going to have any content on it, but we'll talk about that later. Um, and then I'm just going ahead and I'm creating the React route and I'm route rendering the router. Um, from there, let me just Go ahead and show this running, if I can. All right, 
we're done with the slides. All right, let's make sure this is still running. Okay, so this is a .NET app with a React app inside of it. The home page is straight up rendered by .NET. This is privacy. This is the stub from a .dot .NET Pages app. Um, students and other page are being rendered by React. Um, if I open up the inspector, you'll see right here's my React root. Um, here's my script includes my main. Right now I'm running off of dev mode. Um, all right, we're going to go back here. So uh, current React router syntax, you want to load some data, you want to render it in a component. Um, the first way I'm going to demonstrate here is going to be sort of your vanilla React way of doing things without the extra helpers from, from uh, React router. Uh, so I have a loader, which is going to be my student loader. It's an um, API that just returns some faker data. The details are not important. Um, and then I have my component, um, which is going to be my, uh, my student's component, which I'm, I'm importing from this, uh, index lazy. I have two different indexes here. So, um, inside of my app, I'm breaking things out by routes. Uh, so other page just has one component in it. Students has my API for retrieving the student data, has some SAS, um, it has a basic component, and then it has my, my two indexes. So the first one I'm going to talk about is the basic React Lazy. Um, so here is uh, the entirety of the thing. Um, so what you do is you import Lazy from React, and what that does is it wraps this dynamic module include. Um, so lazy, you call as a function, you pass it a function. The function, all it does is it runs a dynamic import um, and returns that. So the dynamic import is going to return a promise uh, that is going to eventually resolve with the uh, component that React, uh, like a, a plain React component. Um, so all this does is it gives you a little wrapper that makes this lazy load feel like a plain React component. So I can say, okay, well, I'm defining students. Students is a lazy load, but then I can just write it as if it was a plain old React component, um, and it will eventually resolve. Uh, there's there's a, a deferred functionality you can use with this where you can render a loader uh, while you're waiting for that lazy load to resolve. Um, I didn't get to the point of implementing that for the sake of the demo, so uh, I just wanted to mention it. Um, but So the important thing here is that this function inside of lazy does not actually get executed until this student's uh, pseudo component gets rendered. So what that does is uh, it means that we're not preloading components that we're not yet going to render. Um, once the render function happens on this higher level component and that student's component, pseudo component that we see here gets rendered, that's going to fire off this function that's defined inside of lazy and do the import. Um, uh, so one of the results of this is our build tools, be it React Scripts or V, they recognize that dynamic import and they do automatic code splitting based on where those input boundaries are, or import boundaries are, I mean. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pop open the terminal so you can sort of see this a little bit, if I can get this back here. So. Uh, so I actually ran a build on here either already, but I'll just do it again. So you can see that instead of one main JavaScript, Vite is building multiple JavaScript modules um, automatically based on where those dynamic imports are happening. And they're sort of prefixed by 
the file names that they're building off of. So I have a couple things called index, so you can't really tell which is which, but you can see my students here is sort of separate from where my main would be. Um, and so that ends up, you know, out here in the final built uh, assets folder. You can see I have, you know, a couple indexes and I have a students. Um, and, and so that split is happening sort of automatically. I don't have to do any extra configuration for that to happen. Um, and because the, uh, at the top level, the React router is controlling which of these components get rendered, it will only render and import the modules related to um, the path that I'm at. So there's a couple nice consequences to that, one being I can run whatever scripts that I want on that page, and I know that that component is only going to render on that one route. Also, if you go ahead and create your styles in CSS or SAS, and you do your imports of your styles inside of those dynamically compo loaded components, they will only render the SAS, or the, the compiled CSS, on the routes that match what you put in there. Um, so, for example, um, if I go ahead and edit my student SAS, I want to put a background color on my body. You can see my student's body. Maybe you can see that. It has a blue background color. My other page, which is also a React page, does not have a background color on the body. So this gives me like the freedom to say, okay, if I'm paying attention to this one route, I can override whatever I want style-wise in the parent page and know that it has no consequences for any other routes. Um, and it gives me a lot of freedom to just sort of do what I want, make the thing work for that one route, and not worry about the rest of the entire application. Um, in addition to that, you have your, your loading efficiencies of not loading the entire single page app in a single load. Um, that wasn't my main problem set while I was working on this. My, the main thing was like, can I isolate the code so that I know I'm working in one place and that's it. Um, so anyway, that's, that's the gist of the, the lazy load, what you get out of it. Um, what I wanted to mention as well is if you are using React Router, you know, they've observed this pattern and they, they uh, realized that you might want to lazy load more than just the single component. Um, if you're using React Router, you're probably providing a loader. There's some other properties for a route that you might want to lazy load that whole thing as a single package. Um, so my student loader here, I'm doing a dynamic import um, as well um, of the API, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and have it do a thing. Um, however, I could just as easily um, use uh, React Router's helpers. Um, they support lazy loading every property that you would define on a route except for the path. Um, so their, their way of sort of tackling this problem of like, okay, well, let's lazy load the entire thing as a single package. And so that's what I have here. Um, basically, you export, uh, the names of your exports should match the properties of a React router. Um, and whatever you put inside of this single file that you're using their lazy loader, it's going to come back and override, no, other way around. It will not override static properties. So you can override them on the route. I wouldn't recommend that, but it will populate unwritten static properties on the React route. Um, so in this case, it just makes uh, some of my, my cobbling things together a little bit easier. Um, instead of um, 
in my main coming up with this whole separate lazy loader for uh, my data loader for the students, I can just get rid of all that. Um, I'm going to use React Router's lazy router, and I'm going to get rid of these too. Um, and inside of the React Router, I'm just exporting a loader, and I'm exporting a component. It's important the naming there um, is a little bit, the naming has to be exactly component on what you export. So, you know, I could call this something else, but then I'd also still need to export it as capital C component. That's how React Router matches it up to its route object. Um, but you can see instead of doing my lazy module loading for the API method for getting student grades, I can just load it like normal import and just map it to this export called loader, and now it's just going to work and... Let's hope and pray that's true, right? <laughs> and you can see my student data is still populating just fine. Um, and, you know, that's just a little extra developer experience, makes it a little easier. If you are using React Router, it gives you a couple little shortcuts um, using their lazy function instead of the built-in React lazy function. Um, but I did want to demonstrate the React-only version first in case you use a different routing solution you know, you don't, you're not tied to React Router. There's no hard dependency here. Um, and, yeah, the only thing that I have left to demonstrate is just that um, this thing actually works at production build time. So I ran a build. I'm going to run another one because I did change some code. Um, and I'm going to go into my... I said I wasn't going to talk about the .NET code. I'm going to come back to it just one more time. I'm going to go ahead and remove the, de the dev mode parameter off of my, um, my partial. And I'm going to go ahead and restart the .NET app. And then we will go back here. It launched a new window already. And you can see that it still works. So that's pretty much it. I was trying to keep it somewhat terse. <laughs> um, if anybody has any questions, uh, happy day. Yes. All right, so with your, with your, this might come down to like the difference between your like micro front end versus code splitting to level, what you call it, you kind of using two different right. Like, I know how it would do it with, like, React Router and, and dynamic imports, but not necessarily through this kind of, like, separate micro front end structure that would run through the .NET. So, like, what if you had, like, a sidebar on this page and a sidebar on another page, and it was, like, the same React component? Yeah, so when you do the, when you, because of the, the way the module processing happens, because you're importing the same component, it's not going to generate separate JavaScript right. modules for the different components that you're importing. It'll reuse the same one. Right. Now, if you if you if you are using the React Router wrapper method where it's kind of bundling it into one module, that would end up in multiple modules. So that would be a maybe a decision point where you say, okay, you know what, I'm not actually going to use the React Router helper method because if I split it out and do it individually, I'll have less total files. Right. So it's sort of a, you could go either way. It makes sense for the, the code splitting part, but how about like the micro front end part? Like how would you, instead of using the route to like render one versus the other, how would you insert that in your like .NET component? Would you need to like use portals or mm -hmm. could you even use portals in that method? I don't. You could use portals. It would probably get pretty ugly. Um, so you're saying like you want them in different places within the same route. Or the same place always depending on routes. Or yeah. So I used, because it 
fit my use case, you, I used React Router as the delineator point between where I load different modules. But you could use a different method for detecting where, so you might put um, elements on the page in markup in, in, you know, in HTML with different IDs and you would delineate based on the ID which components you're loading. As long as you're calling that module load in the uh, keyword that looks like a function, as long as that will not execute until that line is hit. So you can do your delineation any way you need to. So, you know, that would be one way to approach it. You would put different elements on the page. You would put IDs on them that match differently or maybe data attributes that match, that tell you which components to load. And then you would just, you would, you, you would still call React DOM render, but you would call it on different elements. Yeah. So, my computer's decided that I'm done. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, it depends on the project. <laughs> I, a lot of times I've fallen back to, I just have a single page app and the bundle is small enough that I really don't need separate files. Um, there's a trade-off to be made between loading the entire app up front and taking a little bit of the speed hit up front and then never having to load again versus having a faster initial load and then having multiple smaller loads happen as you go. Um, and, you, you know, people would argue with that all day. I think it really depends on your situation. Um, but uh, for this particular use case, the reason why it was valuable to me is that I had this whole uh, .NET Framework MVC app and I knew that there's no time or budget to replace the whole thing in one shot. So I need to inject my little bits of functionality within that context. I'm not going to build an entirely new front end. So to that end, the single page app doesn't fit the use case. I think that's a better thing to, to wrestle with is like functionally, is there a reason to do it versus performance? Like you can argue performance till you're blue in the face. Like, one side or the other, and both sides are right, and it really just depends on your context. Francis, so yeah. Yeah. Um, I think you could certainly get there, um, but you got to think about your whole uh, your whole backend server rendered structure. And I would ask the question: Is there value to it? Um, because like that initial page load is still going to be presented by your kind of containing application, right? So what are you gaining from the server side rendering if it's not richer context on the initial page load, like? I, you definitely could find a way to make it happen, but I'm not sure if there's a value to doing it. All right. <laughs>